the lecture is the link between design and storytelling. If you can't hear me in the back room, uh, row, just raise your hand because I can kind of go a little slow. Uh, so what I like to do to begin with uh, when I do these lectures is start with a couple of quotes. I'm going to go through a few quotes. And the reason why I like quotes is because it kind of gives us the ability to get a context of where artists were and what they were thinking. And so this quote from the great Degas says, Art is not what you see, but what you make others see. Again, the premise here is to reframe our thinking that as artists, we're not here to copy what we see. We're not here just to observe uh, the subject or the external aspect of what we're looking at. That's important. That's where drawing comes in and rendering and representation. But what this uh, conversation is about is going beyond that. And looking at these quotes from these great artists helps us begin to see that that's what they were looking at. So art is not what you see, but what you make others see. That's our job. The great Michelangelo, a man paints with his brains and not with his hands. And one of my favorite quotes by the great Pablo Picasso. There are painters who transform the sun into a yellow spot. But there are others who, thanks to their art and intelligence, transforms a yellow spot into the sun. And so what does this mean? If you're looking at the sun, you're like, oh, in the sky there's a circle, and that circle is yellow, and so therefore I'm going to paint that circle, and I'm going to use yellow paint. That's what you're doing. Or you look at that and you say, well, that's the sun, and the sun is warm, and the sun is hot, and the sun shines, and it radiates. It pulse. It has a pulse. It. How do I capture that in an image? And that's where design comes in. When you focus on that, now you start to actually begin to make people feel the presence of the sun, even though technically it's just marks and paint and pencil. So where do we start? We, we start with asking a couple questions. The first question is, how do the lines in an image support the story? Now, the story is the most important part of this because that is the message that you want to communicate. So when you have uh, an idea or an emotion or a sensation or a feeling that you want to communicate, you then want to begin to ask, well, how do the lines in my work help communicate that? And so you can see in this little graphic to the left uh, that there's something with inside of those circles. Now, if you look at that and you say, oh, there's a triangle in there, but there is no triangle there and yet the mind sees a triangle. And so that's where the power of design comes, because the, the only thing that's actually, the only marks that we're dealing with are these uh, truncated circles. And they're in such an alignment that actually then give us a whole other experience. And so that's something to pay attention to. Another question is space. And we want to ask, how does space support our story? And space really comes down to the math. What's the math that actually is, is, is put into the work that allows us to uh, lay things out, that gives us proportions and measurements and those kinds of things. And then the old good zebra. What are the values and how do the values support the story? And so we're going to tackle these three areas um, as we go through a couple of paintings. Now, first, I want to ask you guys, does anyone out there know who the artist is on the left? And who the artist is on the right. The artist on the left and the artist on the right are actually the same artist. So that's Picasso uh, when he's 50 on the right, doing this beautiful abstraction of the human figure. And that's Picasso when he's about 14 years old. He was trained by his dad. Actually, this is his family. That's his uh, little sister, and that's Picasso in the back, uh, his dad and his mom behind behind his dad. And so you can tell that Picasso, at a very young age, was an incredible draftsman, an incredible composer and designer, an incredible painter. He was extremely well trained. And so when he begins to explore ideas and concepts as he gets older, because he knows the rules, he knows how to do these things, and in that authority and power, he's able to go and explore deeper concepts. Now, what's beautiful about both of these paintings, if you really go and study them, you'll find that the values work, the lines work, and the spacing works. There's really, in either, in both of these images, there's no place in here that you would look and say, oh, the spacing is not off, or there's something strange, or whatever. Um, the lines work, they're elegant. Uh, 
and the values work. So it's not about your style. You can be highly representational. You can be highly abstract. But can you design? Can you communicate? That's what we want to uh, talk about. So you'll see this graphic come up a few times. We always want to start with story. Then we want to focus on line space and value. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a couple of painters uh, and illustrators, and we're going to break down and decode their design and their artwork. So first we're going to start with line. Now what is a line? A line, when I'm training artists at the academy, we just basically break it down very, very simple. It's a mark, a thrust, an edge, an alignment uh, that leads your eye. So anything that moves your eye from one place to another is a line, period. So if you look at this graphic, you'll see that there are there's a dot, a long mark, and a small mark. So a small mark, long mark, and a dot. The purple with the arrow, that's the line. The dark blue spots on that, on that line are called marks. And so there's a difference. The mark is what we see. The line is what we feel. And the designer, the composer, is composing what we feel through what you see. Okay? If you're only copying what you see, then you've lost before you've begun. But if you can, you know, draw what you see, which is good, or draw out of your imagination, but then make us feel something, now we're cooking with butter. Okay, now we're in a very different place. So what happens is once I remove the, the, the purple line, you see the graphic at the bottom, we, st we see the three individual marks, but we feel one continuous line. And that's the key. So we want to be, and this is what um, Degas meant, that, we're, that art isn't drawing what you see, it's making other people... Uh, see what you want them to see, okay? So again, we have this dog, a long line, and three dots, each individual marks and graphics, but we feel this movement. Now, if we look at the second uh, graphic underneath, we have these two, these three marks going across, and there's an alignment. And th But if we look at the third one, it looks very similar, except for that that third mark is just a little bit higher, and therefore it it's out of alignment. But what happens is if you have these three marks and they're in alignment, you have one line. The bottom one has more than one line. One could say it has two. We could even make an argument that there's uh, three or four lines that are in there, okay, horizontal lines. So we want to be very, very careful how we use our lines because one line out of place can break your composition. One line can make or break an image. And that's why we have to be very, very cautious and careful. Um, when crafting a, a master painting. So here is the great Norman Rockwell. I love Norman Rockwell since I was a little boy, about 11 years old, when I fell in love with him uh, after reading his book. And um, and yeah, so Norman is, is, I envision him being in his studio. The art director calls him up, says, Norman, boy, we got to do this uh, cover for the magazine. It's football, American football season, and uh, you got to come up with a with a, with a with a cover, but nobody's winning. So he's walking through his studio and he's flicking up a coin, and he's flicking up a coin, trying to brainstorm some ideas. And he goes Eureka, and it hits him because as you flick up the coin, something begins to happen in your physiology, in your body. There's a certain movement, and movement is energy. And when you become aware that design is actually moving energy through an image, uh, and energy is invisible, right? So you're moving energy, and that's what people are actually feeling when they look at the work. So when you're flicking this coin, coin there's this, this, this forward curving motion, and look it. Boom. There it is. Can you see it? Okay. Pretend you're flicking a coin. Feel how that movement is. And so you have this curve coming through. So let's go back. Can you not not see that curve flowing through that image anymore? It, it's impossible. All of this creates this arc that comes in here. And so our eye moves through the image and it comes up and leads us to that little coin at the top. Now, when you flick a coin, what's the next thing that happens? It comes to the vertical, uh, comes to the top, to the apex, and then it drops. It drops down. 
And that's where the magic is. So how does Norman make us feel the dropping of this coin? Boom. Now, it just so happens that the umpire wears vertical stripes. That is a, a helpful thing. He doesn't need to have that. Norman would have figured out how to make it happen. But by drawing the eye down and using the, the lines in the image from the side of his legs to the verticals in his shirt, I mean, look how vertical and straight the, the side of his head is, okay? Uh, the angles in his face, very vertical. All of this pulls our eye down very, very quickly. And that's the experience. That's the design. It's the flicking of the coin. And the name of this painting is called Coin Toss. We, ha we started with a story. We went into the design. We, we, we have story. We went through design. Jump from space to value. Okay. So here we are looking at a Max, uh, Maxville Parish painting. This is called Ecstasy. It's an incredible painting. Very, very beautiful. But real quick, let's take a look at the line work. We can feel this woman moving in this upward uh, direction. Now, what we see, what we see is her planted on the ground. But if we look at the line work, we feel this movement, this pulling of her, right? So we feel that. You can see it. It's very clear. You feel that now. The reason why is because he's articulating all of these lines in the image that is helping us pull through the image. But he does something with value here that's incredible. And value basically is simple. It's just the relationship between what is light and what is dark in your artwork. And depending on how you combine these lights and darks, you'll have all kinds of experiences. For example, if you look at the first uh, set of values, uh, these are high contrast values, black on white with a 50% gray. Things become very clear. I call this friction. It gives, as your eye moves through the image, it becomes hard because there's friction there. So it, it catches your eye. Now, if you look all the way to the right, these are low value relationships. And so your eye has the ability to move gently with less friction through that area of the image. And that's really important because you can have definition, but still lower the friction. Okay. And as a composer and a designer, when you have a clear story you want to articulate, you, this is becomes an incredible tool to use to help articulate that. So back to Maxfield. So when we're looking at a, a value strategy, what we'll see is that he puts a, a, a strong contrast in the hair, okay? And that hair creates this diagonal that we've already uh, talked about. And as your eye moves down, you'll see that under her dress, again, is a very strong contrast. Okay, or let me have very strong, but a strong contrast in that area. If you squint your eyes, you can really see that it pops. And again, it's moving in in that angle. But this is where the magic of the painting happens. When when our eyes go down and we see the rock that she's standing on, there is a high contrast. And that high contrast is not moving us in the same diagonal. It's moving us in a very different diagonal. It's pulling us down while the other contrasts and lines are pulling us up. Now, why would he do this? Because he's trying to separate her from the ground, okay? And if you look at her legs, you'll see that her legs are very low friction contrast from the background. So if you squint your eyes and you look at this, you actually will feel her legs disappear and her actually floating off the ground. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I believe that. Okay, okay, okay. I come with another example. Same artist, Maxville Parish. Same strategy. So we look at high point of contrast. This is a picture of Icarus. He's the guy who had, he flew, uh, and then he fell. And so here's Icarus. His head is up in the clouds. He's looking at the birds. And if you feel like this plumb line coming from the center of his head, you actually will realize that he's leaning over this cliff. He's not on the cliff. Now, physically, we see he's standing on the cliff, but we feel him flying or up or lifted up off the cliff. Now, how in the world does he do this? Same strategy. He pulls us upward with this uh, 
sinister diagonal. Okay, he's moving us towards the birds. He has this this uh, horizontal, and it's actually not really horizontal. It's actually more of a diagonal if we want to do it correctly. Um, and that's pulling us down. Okay, but if we look at his legs, his legs are very close and uh, they're almost identical in value to the background. And so when you squint your eyes, you see his sword comes down, and that dark part of the sword at the bottom becomes his feet. When you squint your eyes, all of a sudden his feet disappear, and it's almost like he leaps off the edge of that um, cliff. This becomes an animation. This becomes alive. This becomes not a still moment captured in time, but this becomes a moment that requires a movement through time. He He's lifting off. It's alive. And what's even cooler is when you add color, he even uses temperature changes and color changes in hue to when now when you squint your eye, his legs totally disappear into the clouds and he just is flying. Isn't that freaking cool? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> sorry, I just find this stuff amazing. Um, so again, you got to know what you want to communicate. You got to know how to use your lines, your edges, your alignments, your brush strokes to actually communicate those things. You got to know how to use your values to help bring things in, 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 into a certain order that help communicate your story, that support your story. And then you also need to know how to lay out and manage your spacing. And so we're going to go uh, through an example of that here with Emile Friant. Uh, this painting, when I decoded it, was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I, this is one of my favorite paintings of all time because the story behind it is incredible and the um, the design that actually supports the story is just brilliant. And so here we see uh, the name of this painting is All Saints Day. All Saints Day, I'm assuming is a holiday where people celebrate all the saints. Uh, interestingly, I, last year I was in Portugal and I found out that on All Saints Day... Um, wasn't a really good day in Portugal. I, uh, I think around 17 something. There was what happened was there was this typhoon in the Atlantic Ocean, or an earthquake, I mean, in the Atlantic Ocean, and it created a, a typhoon. And so <laughs> this wave came into into Lisbon and just basically wiped out the city. At the same exact time, because of the this earthquake that happened in the um in the ocean. It then had these tremor effects or whatever, and there were earthquakes in the city. And because it was on All Saints Day, the churches had all their candles everywhere. And so it knocked all the candles down and burnt down. It, it set the churches on fire. And so they call this the Day of the Wrath of God because they got flooded out, earthquake out, and burnt down all in the same day. Um very interesting. So All Saints Day, here we are. You have these adults, these people dressed in black, and you can see in the background, it's a long group of people who have who are going to this church. They're bringing floral gifts, okay? You can see the, the ladies are carrying bouquets. Now, here is a man who's in need, and he's sitting on a chair. He's asking for money. That's what his little sign is, and I'll break all this down in a second. And all of these people have walked by him. And if they gave money, he should be overflowing with coin. But he ain't. So let's take a look at the design, the line work. So how does Emil create the sensation that, we're, that we actually ignore the man? Right, because that's what's happening here. All of these people, religious people, walking by, walking by, and they ignore this man. And so, how do you make that happen in your image? Because it's not just drawing the people. You actually have to ignoring is something you can't hold. It's not a noun. So therefore, you have to make us feel that experience. So, Emil uses an incredible strategy. If you notice the arc on the back of the lady's outfit. It goes up and over their head, right, through the trees, and it comes into the building. 
Now, if you notice that Emil puts a vignette at the top left of the image, a vignette meaning a darker edge, you can see that it's a, it's a change in temperature. It's, it's cool. And on the other side of the line is warm. It's dark. And on the other side of the line is light. So it creates an edge. That's what we call an, uh, a line. Okay. So this line comes through. Our eye follows through. And if you see down underneath where it wraps back into the, into the image, again, he uses another vignette. He brings us, he's using value to create a, an edge that makes a line that moves us through to the other side of him. Again, using the same technique. If you move up, you can see that on one side of the line is dull. On the other side, it's brighter. He's using now saturation to help create a transition that gives us an edge that moves our eye, leading us back into this very high contrast of the the board and the um, cup. Okay, All of this works together so that when we look at the adults, our eye moves over and past the man. And it also leads us to what the people are thinking. Oh, here's this guy. He's asking for what? Money, right? Boom. Very profound concept. And he makes us feel it. Now, when we look at the, verti uh, the verticals and diagonals and horizontals, not the curve, but the straight elements in the image, all of a sudden, we have this, do this very strong vertical coming down. It comes down to his elbow, shoots on this no other very strong diagonal, boom, takes us straight to his knee, right? But when we look at the dominant horizontal and the two angles, we realize that the horizontal is coming from the face of the little girl, and it, it, if you follow it all the way across, it, it comes to the bottom of the man's face. Her arm, which is a very strong diagonal, shoots us right up to the man's face. The angle used in the background creates, uh, shoots us to his face. If you notice that that whole angle, it creates like a, a nice little triangle. That the open end of the triangle is basically where the little girl exists in. So the little girl's focus is not on the man's need for money, but on his face, on his humanity. Very beautiful concept, very profound. He juxtaposes that with the adults who are trying to ignore this man. The little girl, her full attention is on the man. Incredible. So th these are some line strategies that he's used to help communicate this idea. Now, let's get into spacing. Space is very simple. It's anything that's not a line. So it's around a line, it's in a line, it's on the sides of lines. Anything that's not a line is space. Very simple. Now, we can break up space in a couple different ways. So when we're looking at a major rectangle, uh, let's say the, the canvas that you're, you're working in, we could call that a main rectangle or, uh, or the mother rectangle. Okay. And in this case, what I want you to pay attention to is that it is a landscape orientation laid out horizontally and therefore the smallest side is going to be its height okay the longest side will be its width now if you take the smallest side and you copy that and you flip it so it's horizontal it creates a square because a square is a rectangle that has its height is equal to its width so this square that we're looking at comes directly from the mother rectangle. Okay. Now, if we took the mother rectangle and, which is horizontal, and we flipped it vertically, so now it's, it's vertical, and we scaled it down and shrunk it so that its new height would be the same height as the mother, the original mother rectangle, we would now call that a reciprocal, or we could call it a daughter rectangle. What they all have in common is they all share the same height. What the mother and the daughter have in common is that they're actually the same exact rectangle, except that one is flipped 90 degrees. That's it. Very simple. Now, it's simple, but it took me 25 years to really understand that. But I've been able to make it very simple now. So if we take the main mother rectangle, we can begin to see that Emil puts certain elements on the top right line, okay, where we can see the women, the, the, the little girl, and, and, and the two ladies. And so this is the main rectangle. 
Now, if we take the reciprocal and come in from the left, the left reciprocal or the left daughter rectangle, what we can see now is with inside that X on the left hand side, that, that triangle, that's where Emil fits the man. Okay, there's a certain spacing that works and he, he wants that part of the story to be over there. It's, it's off to the left. And the edge that's created by this daughter reciprocal, or this reciprocal, this daughter rectangle, creates the back of the girl. But you also notice how it also pushes the women on the other side of that rectangle. So with inside that first rectangle, the only things that exist is the little girl and the man. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Now, if we come in from the right and we bring in another rectangle, again, another daughter rectangle, boom, we can see that from the foot to the hand of the little girl, she is locked into that space. And where they overlap, where that viscous Pisces creates that overlapping section, that is where the girl takes space, okay? The little girl is in her own space. She's set apart from the adults. The adults are in their own little huddled mass. She's stepping out. Notice that Emil does not permit the adults to occupy any part of the space in which the girl is. That is a strategic, intentional, deliberate action. And the little girl is set apart. She's in her own space. The word holy actually means to be set apart, right? She's in her own space. Her intention is focused on the humanity of this man, where the religious people are trying to ignore him. We don't want to think about that. Nothing here to be seen, okay? Absolutely gorgeous. So this is one way of using space to help communicate and tell your story. So let's take a look real quick at three areas of value that help tell the story. The first one, obviously, is the board. And against the board, this light board is a dark uh, can that he's holding, cup, can, bowl, whatever that he's holding for his uh, charity. We have this beautiful arabesque in the background uh, that's, again, created by the flow of the people, which then bring us back to the man as well. But when we look at number three, this is a very fascinating experience. <clears throat> when I was looking at this painting, I noticed that in the girl's hand, there was a little tiny cut. And I said, aha, Emil messed up. I found a, I found a place where he screwed up. And then the little voice said into me, uh, inside me said, um, you idiot, this is a master, master composer. Do you not think, you think there he messed up? And I'm like, uh, no, not really. Um, so I investigated, and then I found the most genius, most incredible moment in this entire painting. He didn't mess up. She's holding something. Now, at first, I thought, okay, she's holding something. It's probably like a little coin, right? But then I thought, well, back in those days, you probably didn't have kids walking around with little coins handing them out. Um... So what is it? What is it? Do you see the cut in the hand? Of course you see it. It's obvious. But if you look very, very closely above the hand, the value of what she's holding is almost identical to what's behind it. The wall. Therefore, when the values are the same, the friction is so low that the eye can move past it and you don't see the nuance. But he uses temperature, and what she's holding is warm, and what the wall is behind her is cool. And so there's a shift, but you have to be very sensitive to see it. And when you see it, you realize what she's holding is a little tiny flower. Now, what kind of flower? She's holding the flower that the woman has. And so she's not giving the man money. All of these people... Tens, hundreds of people are going to this place, bringing f flowers to honor dead people. Bouquets of flower to honor dead people. And this little girl, in the midst of all of that, 
takes one flower to honor a living human soul. When you can, like, most people would probably walk through a museum, see this painting, and say, oh, that's beautiful. Let's move on to the next one. And they miss, they miss it. It's kind of like looking at a book and saying, wow, what a pretty cover. Or, wow, and you quickly skim through it and say, whoa, those are, that's a pretty layout of words. But you never take the time to actually read it. You miss the power of it. You miss the story. You miss the intelligence of the artist. You, I'm telling you, when you can decode work, you actually like literally feel that you're sitting in the soul, in the mind. You're not just feeling, you're, you don't feel like you're sitting shoulder to shoulder. You actually feel like it's kind of creepy sometimes. You feel like you're actually in the body, in the mind of the artist because you realize, oh my gosh, he had to sit down and think through these concepts and then figure out how to actually engineer for us to experience, have this visual experience. It's just incredible. So again, story, line, space, value. Now, if you guys would like me to show you one more, I can. <laughs> and I guess I will show you one more. Okay. So here we go. When we were looking at the space, inside of a rectangle, there are two lines, two major diagonals or major angles. When it moves from the top left to the bottom right, we call that a sinister angle. If you want to try to communicate something that's secret or sacred or hidden or mysterious, you want to then design within a sinister angle. The opposite is a Baroque angle. A Baroque angle invites us in. If you want to have an experience that welcomes someone into it, brings you into this experience, then you want to compose and design within uh, a lot of Baroque angles. Okay? So you have to become very conscious on um, the psychology of your line making, your value strategies, and your spacing strategies. So in this Caravaggio painting, he, he wants to bring us into this experience. And so let's quickly look at one line, just one line strategy that he's employed. And here it is. Boom. All of these beautiful curves running through the top of the image. All of these curves running through the fabric. All just wrapping you into this little hole. Boom. Incredible. Incredible. Look at that. Nowhere you can look will you not feel now this movement that brings you into this experience. So now when we look at the spacing, we realize, okay, we have this major uh, sinister going on with inside this mother rectangle. Now, why is it a major sinister? It's because along the edge of that sinister, there are far more important moments that are put on there than on the Baroque line. On the Baroque, primarily you have Jesus' hand uh, holding Thomas's hand, which makes sense because he's inviting you into that, right? But notice... Everything above the sinister line, we don't really stop to look at. So, in this experience, as we're brought through very quickly, it's not important what Jesus looks like. It's not important what the other apostles and who they are. Even Thomas himself is not important. The only thing we have is his face, not his head, inside uh, below that sinister. The experience, the, the ability to boldly question and then to be given a, a, an experience to prove to your own self what you need. That's what this is about. It's not about the saints. It's not even about Jesus. It's about you and coming into this little experience. So we come down this to Baroque, I mean this uh, sinister angle. And now we come into what we call a rebated square. Okay, we bring in one of the squares. In this case, it's a right rebated. Um, and we come in and we look at the edge that's created and bam! His finger is landed on that vertical and it creates the edge of the wound. The rebated square, because it's a square, oftentimes is used to land extremely important moments in the composition or in the story. Because it, it's such a grounding, uh, rectangle. It gives such structure to, to, to things that he then intentionally lays this experience on that, on that division. 
Now, if we come in from the left and we bring in a reciprocal, all of a sudden we realize that the sinister is very weak in this um, image. But what isn't weak is the Baroque. We do have the Baroque uh, creating primarily the face of Jesus, coming down, creating his chest, coming down, creating the other edge of the wound, Jesus' hand, and even articulating part of the fabric. And so there's a lot of things in on that Baroque that's very, very important. And so when we bring it all together and we read purely the layout, we start at the first one, and we see the big, long, sinister, and we say, wow, this is a sacred and secret moment. And we look at the rebated, and we say, and this is a fundamentally important experience. And then we come in and we look at the reciprocal that's bringing us through the Baroque, and we say, and we're also invited into sharing into this experience. And this is what the design is telling us. If you follow the design, it will always reveal the story. This is what the artist Caravaggio is designing and composing to give us an experience. Now, there's a lot more to go in it. We didn't talk about values. We didn't, you know, there's a lot of other line strategies and gamuts and thrust maps and all kinds, changes of charges, all kinds of wonderful things that go into building these experiences. But I just wanted to give you an overview of, um, because it just is what it is. On that note, thank you guys for spending this time with me.